you for all that you're doing through all of this COVID stuff. How is that? How is that going for you? You know, so far, fine. I'm just really irritated with the Department of Public Health because they're not giving any private docs vaccines. They're just giving it to all the, you know, the retail, the ginormous companies that already, um, you know, so I'm like, so it's kind of funny, right? So I mean, like, granted, like, I mean, I'm doing it totally for free. I'm not going to make any money on COVID vaccines. But a lot of doctors who might be able to, um, you know, it's, you know, they get an admin fee of like 20 bucks a shot. So if you're all of a sudden you're like, Hey, like let's support small businesses. I'm like, wait, whatever happened to that? Where you're just saying like, you're not going to give any of the independent docs COVID vaccines. Um, yeah. And it's a so, shame that there's no system for that, right? Like there's just no system that allowed for small independent distribution versus just large scale ind- distribution. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's just kind of odd. So, I mean, I don't, I don't really know what to, I don't know what to really make of it, but mm-hmm. you know, which is probably, is this part of the reason why you, uh, you know, first I, you know, I wanted to just uh, welcome, you know, first off, uh, you know, I'm really excited to kind of talk about all of this, but is that one of the reasons why, you know, you kind of left the traditional healthcare system, you know, kind of in general is to some of this red tape where you can't really give the, the individual specialized attention that, you know, you wanted to with people? You know, uh, yes. I mean, I think a lot of it is right. So if you look at the system, the system is built around transactions. The system is built around, um, you know, just revenue generating, you know, options, right? So the whole system is built to say, how do I maximize what I bill so that I get paid the most, but then, the downstream effect of that is um, how does it affect the patient and it affects the patient because they're paying more and more out of their pockets because insurances are saying, Hey, we're going to make these more high deductibles. Um, so at the end of the day, um, everyone's actually kind of losing. So, uh, yeah. and then you're not, you're not giving good care because for you to keep these, you know, ginormous overhead companies um, you've got to generate, you've got to charge a whole bunch extra to cover your overhead. So, you know, the more and more I thought about it, you know, I, I was put in positions where I had to talk to doctors and, and physicians and providers saying, hey, look, like you didn't generate X amount of money. And, you know, when we're negotiating their contracts, it was like, let's see how much money you brought in. It had nothing to do with um, how much what type value, of care you, yeah. what type of care you get. And so, you know, that's where I really just sort of, I struggled with it, uh, you know, both internally, but also like, how can I, how can I penalize someone for trying to do the best they can, um, giving good care to their patients, but then also saying like, hey, like this particular number was off. Doesn't make sense. So, you know, people talk about value-based care as like this new thing. And I, you know, I don't know. I feel I have mixed feelings about it, right? Because on one hand, you know, you're telling docs, you're going to get paid based on the quality, right? And so if your patient doesn't want their colonoscopy, boom, that's a ding against you, which then correlates a ding against, you know, how much you get paid. So at the end of the day, you're being penalized for someone else's actions because Mm. saying, well, you doctor did not convince them to get their colonoscopy. So therefore you should be punished. Um, So the whole system is just built around the wrong things. I think that the value-based model perhaps is a step in sort of thinking about it the right way, but it's a long way to go. Yeah. Yeah. I love, I love the, um, uh, your mission that you have out there. I want to read it for a second. Um, and it says, I left the traditional healthcare system because I believe healing and care happens in relationships, which the traditional system doesn't always allow and sometimes builds barriers to prevent. Healthcare should be accessible yet personalized, affordable yet high quality, comprehensive yet simple, and ultimately you should feel cared for, which is really like, it's a, just a, a powerful statement that, you know, you make, and I, there's a little bit in the middle, but I, I wanted to just kind of share that because, um, you know, it's just a great way to kind of approach what you're doing. Um, and I would imagine it gives people that you work with um, an extreme amount of like comfort and feeling knowing that you're that reliable person that they can turn to and you're not doing this just out of, um, you know, building costs into something. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I tell people, I tell my patients and even prospective patients, look, if I wanted to make lots of money, I wouldn't be doing this, right? <laughs> I can make much more money working somewhere else, you know, churning out the mill and saying, all right, I'm going to do like, you know, you know, see like four or five patients an hour, let me write really crappy notes because like, I don't want to waste time. Like I could get paid a ton of money doing that, right? But at the end of the day, like, what are you doing that for, right? And so 
there's um and so everything i said in that is are things that i really mean so i, I don't mm-hmm. just um you know granted i might be a little poetic with my wording i just tend to be that way yeah um, but it's, it's really about just being authentic right and i tell yeah. my patients like look i don't know everything like if you want a doctor who knows anything well good luck finding them but that's definitely not me um but what i do promise is that i will do my best to help you that's that's all i can do right yeah. and, and i shouldn't do less right so it's really about just trying to say like look i am here for you um i will do my best um and that is the one thing i can definitely promise all my patients is that I do my best, right? And am I, am I perfect? Am I going to get everything right? Um, you know, medicine, as, there's a science element to it, but there's also an art element to it, right? And it's mm-hmm. finding out well, what's going to work for one person may not work for the other. There's guidelines and things, but so much of it is a relationship, right? So knowing like, what does Scott like makes me say, well, how can I change what I may recommend based on what I think Scott is likely to go through? Well, because, it, you know, every person's different. I have different health goals for myself than other people have. So if you treat me the same way that you would treat somebody else, it's a disservice to me, right? Like, so you get to know people and you get to understand what they're trying to accomplish, what they're trying to do for themselves. And then you get to make recommendations. But most people that we go to don't have that kind of time to understand those things, to, 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 to truly, you know, figure out they're here to address whatever it is that you're coming in for today and then, you know, kind of move on. Um, and so I really love that even from the very beginning, um, the first time I met you, you know, there's just an element of care that comes with everything that you do with people, which is, which is really nice. And it's really, you know, you can feel that, which is really a great way to be, especially, you know, for somebody that's going to be coming to see you, um, you know, for all their health concerns, they know that they have somebody that has their best interest at heart versus, um, you don't always feel that way when you get into the traditional healthcare system. Yeah. And it's, it's about the environment you create. It's about, I think there's so much, you know, I'm pretty casual. Right. And so probably for some, you know, it's like, Oh, it's like a little too casual, but I feel like, you know, one thing that I have found that COVID has taught all of us is look, we're all real. We're all people. We all have kids running around in the background. We've got lives. Um, and it has allowed all of us to just be who we are. Right. And yeah. so, you know, my, my, you know, I have some folks who, who intern in shadow with me and they're always like, look, you're just like, you, you got your, you have one shoe off. You're like, you got your like knee bent in and sofa sitting there chatting, like as if you're like at home having a cup of coffee or whatever. Um, but that's what people want. They want yeah. comfort. <clears throat> well, and you know, certainly in my, in my work as a recruiter, the one thing that I always felt was the more that I could make somebody comfortable then the more that they're willing to talk and and share an experience and kind of open up. And so, you know, having it not be this kind of stoic environment where it's very, okay, answer this question and all of this, you know, people, once they get comfortable, they're more open to sharing information, right? And that's ultimately what you're trying to get. You're trying to get information from somebody that is true and authentic to what's going on, not just, oh, what I, what I need to tell my doctor. And I think that everyone kind of gets caught up in this place of like, okay, well, we all know that our health is in our hands, but when the, you know, if a doctor says something, we don't often feel like, you know, it's appropriate to, to, to maybe have that conversation with, because it's sometimes super quick, right? Like you sometimes don't even get more than just a couple of minutes with somebody because somebody else is getting all the information. A doctor comes in, does a couple of things, and then he's off to something else. And so being able to sit down and have a conversation with somebody that is already comfortable, it immediately puts down other people's guards and know that, hey, I can have a conversation. So, you know, you being authentic allows other people to be authentic. And I think that that's the the great thing about that. Yeah. Yeah, Um, yeah. And so, you know, we've talked in the past. I know that one thing that I'm, I I really want to talk to you about um, you just went on a Ted talk and, and I love one-on-one conversations, but we talked about larger groups. I kind of build things up where I start to get in front of a group and the, you know, the sweat just starts dripping down my back because I get just, I build up anxiety that isn't there. Uh, But how was that Ted talk for you? What was, what was that whole experience like? You know, I've always marveled at TED Talks, right? Because you look at them and you're like, how do they do this? It's flawless. It's perfect. And then, and then you notice that they all have this 
theme to them and the way they we weave their stories. Um, and, you know, when I got selected to do the TED Talk, you know, I was really nervous, right? Because I was like, how am I, I, I couldn't imagine what the end looked like. Um, but it's mm. a process, I tell you, you know, it's, we had about six months of training and coaching where it's assigned our own TED coach. Um, and every coach is different. I mean, I happen to have, I think, you know, in my personal opinion, um, a fantastic coach um, who also happened to be a TED um, you know, organizer himself for a TEDx organizer. So he, he came in with two different perspectives, right? One as a TED coach, but one as an organizer to say, what, how does the public view something? And, mm. um, and so we went through edits and edits of, you know, speech writing and you'd be like, no, we're taking out this whole paragraph. Like, no, mm -hmm. and then, you know, a lot of negotiating. I mean, ultimately, you know, he made the, of course. Me have the final call. Right. But part yeah. of it's also, you know, him saying, what do people want to hear? Mm -hmm. um, and how do you take something and make it not salesy? Cause that's also my biggest fear, right? Is that, and even of when course. I talk to my patients at the end of the day, look, I'm, I'm a doctor first businessman second. I'm not here to sell you a product. I'm here to share with you what I can offer you. If you want it, fine. If you don't want it, that's fine too. But my whole premise is giving you choice. So mm -hmm. with the Ted talk, I was afraid of coming off salesy and I wanted to be more educational and inspiring. So, but the, the, it transformed like just the whole way I think about presentations, the whole way yeah. and I've, I've gone through a lot of, you know, presentations before, but, and, and I've done a fair amount of stuff like with channel, you know, channel three news and stuff. I've done live TV interviews. So I was already comfortable, you know, doing something live, but um, doing it on the TED platform that like live, lives forever and has the brand is different. Um, yeah. But I think along the way Absolutely. I made great friends. I keep in touch with my TED presenters. Um, you know, it's, it's a journey. It's, it's a, it's a different independent journey that by the time you get there and you're like, I'm here to share this idea, this thought, this thing I believe in so much. Um, it's, it's exciting. Yeah. 100%. And, uh, and it was such a great, uh, it was such a great talk. I loved every single minute of it. Uh, so congratulations on that. It's such an accomplishment to, to kind of get that out there and, and to do that. So hats off. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. And so, you know, one of the biggest things that, you know, as I've been working with people, uh, you know, COVID was, was tough for a lot of folks on a lot of different levels. Um, so how did, how did the past year, cause you know, you opened up a business not so long ago and then kind of COVID hit. So did COVID kind of impact some of that for you? Um, but also, you know, how did it impact the people that you were seeing, right? I'm sure there's a lot of different things that potentially came up for people um, during the last year that, uh, so, you know, were probably a little unique. Yeah. So um, let's talk nationally, right? Nationally, yeah. we heard about primary care practices closing. I heard about doctors getting laid off. Um, not a single direct primary care practice across the country that I know of closed. Mm. Um, interestingly enough, more opened, continued to grow. Because what we were doing in the direct primary care space is something that the rest of the world is beginning to catch up to, right? We always texted our patients. We always emailed our patients. We were always accessible. We were always affordable. Telehealth was something that was very normal in the direct primary care space. So things that people began to ask for and see because COVID came, we already had it. When mm. people worried about, I lost my benefits from my employer. Well, no big deal because our practices don't depend on insurance anyway. So mm -hmm. You know, not a single one of my patients left because of COVID having changed their lives, right? Um, they actually saw more and more value to it by saying, hey, you know what? Like my relationship with my doctor is independent of what insurance I have, who my employer mm -hmm. is. And, you know, the fact that I might be at home quarantining, I could still, you know, get care from my doctor. So, you know, it, it, I think it showed the rest of the world more and more the power of direct primary care. And you saw more and more doctors beginning to say, Hey, you know what? I want to do this mm -hmm. um, because it makes sense to everyone. Yeah. Now, are you able to um, link folks with one of the things I'm sure, you know, that has come up uh, just from people that I've talked to is just our own mental well being. And so the more that we have, um, you know, our and look at mental health issues in, in, in today's world, and certainly COVID, you know, really put that to the forefront for a lot of folks. Um, how are you able to kind of help and facilitate that for individuals, especially have you seen a rise in folks looking for, you know, therapy or, or, or some version of, you know, trying to 
you know, help a situation out or, or, or realizing that they're in some, some maybe some negative habits that uh, are not so positive habits that they could, you know, kind of turn around? Yeah, I think um, COVID has put a lot of just overall stress on families, right? Some families have not even left the house for grocery stores. The kids are at home. They're completely isolated. They're not even visiting relatives or friends. Um, and, and so part of it, you know, there's definitely been a lot of social disconnect in, in many ways. Um, there's also um, just sort of even like telehealth, right? I mean, I love telehealth, but there's something to be said about meeting in person. Um, yeah. there, there's that in-person relation. We're social beings. And I think that, you know, things like Zoom and things have, have definitely helped, but there's a lot of stress and frustration, right? You, you've got parents who um, both might be working. You've got kids who are supposed to be quote homeschooling. And I'm going to put that in quotes because like, you know, if you're not supervising them, how do you even know what they're doing? It's super um, hard. And really like, you know, trying to trying to have your kids homeschool with you doing work it was you know it's a lose-lose situation for everybody right it is and, and we haven't been able to get much sort of mental break space right mm -hmm. so you can't go on a vacation you can't even go on a weekend trip because you're worried about well when am i going to have to quarantine who am i going to expose to so all of that has put a lot of stress and i've definitely seen it across um my patients i think a lot of it's even just talking about it mm -hmm. number one you know calling it out number two um, you know, you're not alone because we're all feeling it and then brainstorming with other people. Well, how do you cope with this? Right. And what strategies have you developed? So I haven't had a lot of people ask for formal therapy per se, but I think a lot of people have just, there's this overwhelming, like I'm worn out of COVID. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, and that, but it's, you know, it, it's still around. And unfortunately, I think emotionally, what it's also done is COVID has become highly politicized and, you've sort of now have health and politics going together and your emotions from politics are spilling over with your health. And then you're sort of disagreeing with family members on your health aspect, but that's become political. And then you have further separations of relationships. So, so I think true. it's been learning about how do you compartmentalize your life a little bit more? What do you talk about? What do you not talk about? And how do you still maintain those social connections? Mm -hmm. um, Zoom is great. You know, video is great, but um, you know, there's something about hugging and, shaking hands and that, that you just can't always get just from a wave mm -hmm. or, a, you know, even, even an elbow bump and fist bump, right? There's an, there's an act of the physical contact that yeah. creates human connection. It's just, yeah, it really is. And, and, and especially for me with people that I know that I'm close to, even some people that I'm not like, I'm a hugger. I like to, you know, like say hello and give people a hug and, it's super weird to not do that. It's like a break from who I am, which causes anxiety. It's just like, it's, it's weird. It's a weird feeling. Like I get it if people don't want to hug and I, and I, and I understand your, you know, people's personal space, but when it's a natural occurrence, especially like with family members and you would see people, but yet, you know, we wouldn't get too close. It's weird. It's just, it's, it's not natural. And so um, if we haven't, you know, found an outlet to, to release that stuff, then it just, it, uh, it, 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 it causes a lot of frustration and anxiety for folks, for folks. And some of it's also like, I think the biggest thing is talking about it, right? So let's say even now we you know, yeah. go to visit someone's house, there's this, this is anxiety of, do they want us to wear a mask all the time? Do they not want us to wear a mask all the time? Should mm -hmm. we bother going if the kids have to wear a mask all the time? So there's, oh, you've already created this, even the thought of going to someone's house is stressful because you're like you, you don't know what their expectations of you are and if you can meet them so so much of this is honestly just calling it out and say hey guys like would what is your comfort level do you want us to wear a mask do you not want us to wear a mask and and have those conversations mm -hmm. um but people just find it awkward to do so because you haven't had to do it before, right? You just went to their house and you had a, you know, whatever. And now well, you're- And how many times I still sometimes get out of my car heading into the supermarket or something like that. And I don't have a mask on me. And I'm like, what am I doing? Like, but it's just, it's not natural. And it's still not natural, you know, a year later. And, and it's also, you know, to get away from judging the other person that might yeah. have a slightly different belief about something than you, but try to hold back judging because that judging- is going to further create your own anxiety. Yeah. Listen, I don't want to wear a mask, but you know, I have asthma. And if I get something that settles into my chest, like it's a problem for me. And so I do it out of protection for me, but also protection from other people that potentially, you know, can get it. And so I understand 
folks that are extremely healthy and this probably wouldn't phase them whatsoever, but for me, it's different. And so therefore I treat it differently. And, but that's it, but that just goes along with everything else, right? Like just because my opinion is different than yours doesn't make either of us wrong. And so, Correct. you know, uh, respecting people's opinions, respecting people is just, you know, and, 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 but unfortunately we see that that doesn't always happen. Um, and we don't live in that world, but we, you know, we have to do the best we can. And, and, and that piece, I think is, is what you said is key, right? Cause over the past you know, year and a half or so we've seen, I personally have seen a lot of judgment, uh, mm -hmm. and a lot of disrespect saying, well, if you do this, then it means that you believe in this. And therefore I judge you to be whatever. Right. And, and so, you know, I've been trying to advocate for breaking that away. Like, why are you, why, number one, why are you spending your own mental time judging someone else? Yeah. Number, number two, um, they could still have good intentions. Um, they might have a different opinion on things, um, but it doesn't make them a bad person. Mm -hmm. And why do you go to the, why do you, you know, our actions sometimes are based on our knowledge, right? And we might have gaps in our knowledge, but why go to attack someone's personality? It's not a good feeling for that person, but also, frankly speaking, it's not a good feeling for you because you're going to carry that negative emotion within you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's going to sit there and it's going to, you know, further perpetuate other negative thoughts and situations. And, you know, um, and it's unfortunate. Uh, but, you know, um, one thing that I always like to connect and talk to people on, um, and I started doing this in my recruiting days, and and I still do it with uh, with, with you know with people that I um, have on the podcast. Is I'm always interested to understand, you know, things that people are proud of. And so when you look back, you've got a great history aside from family and kids and all of that stuff, because obviously that's our that's our number one you know thing that we're most proud of at times, um, well, always. Um, what are you most proud of that you've been able to achieve or do or just kind of be, if you will? Um, you know, I, you know, kind of when you look back at your career and, and, and what you've done, it doesn't always have to be just work, but um, I'm always interested in, uh, um, you know, where people are proud of those achievements. Yeah, I mean, I've got a few that I can think of offhand. I think the first one um, was my very first day of high school, um, where I remember thinking to myself very intentionally, um, you know, saying, I want to walk away being valedictorian. And it was because my cousin was, and I was inspired. And I was like, well, if she can do it, I can do it. Um, and, you know, and I left my high school being the first rank in my class, which was, you know, for me, and, and, it's a little thing, but it was the beginning of saying, I can set a goal for myself and I can Love work that. to achieve it. Um, it's, and that's, I, a, that's so powerful right there because we have those lessons in life. And I didn't realize it until I started kind of looking back and doing a lot of reflecting once I got to this kind of inflection point for myself. But we have a lot of that success and we have the ability to drive kind of what we want. Um, and sometimes we don't actually realize it for you to say, I want this and then work for four years to then be able to achieve that allows you to say, okay, some things may take a long time to achieve, but if I do this on a daily basis, then I will hit that goal. And it's such a powerful thing to give yourself at 18, that whole reflect 17, 18, to give yourself that whole reflection point of, I said that I was going to do this and then I did it regardless of what it was. But you now gave yourself that power to understand that you can move yourself in the direction that you want in life. Correct. And then you begin to sort of challenge yourself with other not unconventional things, right? So I, um, I, it was a dream of mine to always work at the World Health Organization. And so um, when I was in college, I was like, you know what, there was this sort of traditional application route. Um, and then you begin to test the idea saying, you know what, let me not just go apply and throw my resume in with a bunch of stuff. Let me contact the departments directly. So I, here I am like college student, um, reaching out to directors at the WHO saying, hey, will you give me a job for me to come work with you? And one of them did, right? And so once again, well, and, and, and I got to work there and work with these, you know, delegates from all over the world, attend the World Health Assembly. And so once again, you're sort of saying, well, I went a non-conventional route and I got to a destination that I wanted to. So it begins to open up your path to say, 
I can think of different ways of getting to where I need to be. Mm, I love that. And that's so powerful because, you know, you don't have to follow somebody else's version of what you should do, right? If you want this and this is a desire, then you do whatever it takes. And yep. whatever it took was not just being hung up on, okay, I'm going to submit my application, but I'm going to put myself in a position to be rejected quite a bit. And, yep. and that's okay because what happened? You found that person that saw what you wanted them to see and saw that in you and said, we're ready to give you a chance. And that's amazing because that's all that it takes. But you have to, if you just sent one to one person and then gave up, you would have never got that. It takes, it takes more than just one email. It takes more than just one phone call for anything. You know, it's, it's funny. I don't think I've ever shared this with you is when I was two, um, I lived with my aunt in Ohio and they used to play Whitney Houston songs. And my favorite song when I was two, and that has sort of influenced the way I think of so many different things was her song, the greatest love of all. Right. Mm. And there's a line in there that I have over the, and people who know me well know that like, it's, it, that line means a lot to me where she says, um, you know, I decided long ago never to walk in anyone's shadows. If I fail, if I succeed, at least I live as I believe, no matter what they take from me, they can't take away my dignity, right? And so there's that, the, the, the self-conviction yeah. of those lines is so powerful. And, and we've seen those themes in so many different ways, but even with my practice here, like I, I don't know what the future is gonna look like, but I know what tomorrow is gonna look like and mm -hmm. that's okay with me. And, and yeah. so th there's that, if you believe in doing the right thing and your heart and soul are in there, just let's let the world call, you know, conspire to make it happen. I love that. That's, that's, uh, that's, that, that's, that's fantastic. And that's really, um, it's so powerful. And, you know, you listen to all these different messages and people have been trying to share that for so long and it really, you know, it just, it's, it's out there and it's available for people. We just have to put in the work. And I think that that's just where it comes down to is that, understanding that this is a process that nothing is just going to happen that you have to want these things believe in yourself and then try and try again um and uh and yeah i'm a big i'm a big one for songs because there's a miley cyrus one i'm not a big miley cyrus fan but you know there's one where she says my mom always told me that i could so i did um and it's just that it is giving yourself that self-belief, whether you can get it from somebody else or you get it internally, you know, eventually you start to believe it and, you know, you start to then act accordingly and, you know, you focus on your purpose, the things that drive you, the things that are unique and individual to you because somebody else's path is not right for you. Everyone's different. And so, you know, we all have to carve that out for ourselves. Uh, so that's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. And so, you know, as we kind of wrap up, I know, I know we have a, you know, uh, a half hour here, but I really wanted to understand, you know, um, we've kind of gone through a lot, but as we talk about the future and what you want folks to know about your business and how you help them, um, you know, what would, what would you like to leave people with the kind of understanding, you know, your business, understanding the way that, you know, you work with people? Yeah, I think a lot of the, the biggest thing is many of the assumptions, you know, about healthcare are completely wrong, um, right? I think a lot of us, and myself included, I've had to unlearn a lot of the things that I was traditionally taught to do, right? Like, like, oh, you can't, you know, have a visit outside with a patient. Who says you can? If the patient's fine with it, and you're fine with it, go for a walk and do your medical visit while you're walking and talking, right? And so there's so many things that we are trained to think about. We're put in boxes. Um, and I, I challenge each of us to say, well, break those boxes down and imagine what you could get out of it, right? And so um, even for you know, my own practice, it takes a while for my patients to begin to say like, oh yeah, the system's trained me to think this way, but I don't have to think that way with you. Um, and mm. it, it transforms the experience completely, right? I've had patients recently who are like, I'm excited to come see you. I'm like, wow, like, I mean, granted, like, I mean, it's, that's cool. Yeah. But, you know, it's like, who's excited to see that? <laughs> but, you know, it's, hey, I'll take it. Yeah. But it, it, it's, it's just, I think, give things a chance, open your mind, um, question what you've learned and question what you're trained to think because your assumptions may be built on a fundamental premise that doesn't work. Mm. Yeah, 
No, that's fantastic. And so um, where can folks find your information? Uh, I know I'll post some of that as well, but how can, how can people reach out to you? Um, so I, I try to stay active on social media. Um, and at least if not at the moment, I schedule it in advance, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, so they can find me on my website, www.for the number four elements, E-L-E-M-E-N-T-S, dpc.com, um, or, you know, Facebook, Instagram, um, and, uh, LinkedIn for a lot of the professionals. And I, I post a lot of both educational content, but also just awareness content as well. So, um, feel free to follow. Excellent. Well, Vashanth, it's been a pleasure. It's, uh, you know, from our first conversation, it's been great getting to know you. Uh, and today's conversation is, uh, is right up there. Uh, I've enjoyed every single one of them and I look forward to uh, our future conversations. Awesome. Great chatting, Scott. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Thanks so much.